Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Mother's Day service uh, and our service of Holy Communion. It's good to have you with us as we worship God together, we hear his word, we remember all that he's done for us, and we remember our families as well on this Mother's Day. And a uh, warm welcome if you're a visitor, or if you're joining us on the live stream as well. We are all one in God's family, united by the Holy Spirit. And as we come together, some of us will have very mixed emotions. Some of us will be rejoicing in our family lives. Some of us will be feeling sadness or sorrow or pain. And as we start our service today, we're reminding ourselves that whatever we feel, however we come together today, God is faithful. God holds us in his arms. He doesn't let us down. Uh, I'm going to read a few verses from Psalm 55. The psalmist is in trouble. He's surrounded by his enemies. And he says this, But I call to God, and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon, I utter my complaint and moan, and he hears my voice. He redeems my soul in safety from the battle that I wage, for many are arrayed against me. And then a couple of verses further on he says this, Cast your burden on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. We're reminded that God is faithful, and he never lets us down when we trust in him. Uh, in our first song, we're going to remind ourselves of God's faithfulness. We see it in his word. We see it out in the world around us in the second verse, and we make it very personal in the third verse. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. So however we are feeling this morning, let's remember God's faithfulness to those who love him. We're going to stand, we're going to sing our first song, and during that we've got flowers uh, for the children to take round to the mothers within the congregation. I think probably uh, there's enough for everybody in the congregation today. We have a massive collection of flowers. So let's stand to sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. If I could have some help, please. Yeah. <laughs>
Do please sit down. And uh, the flowers are magnificent. Uh, thanks so much to Anne and her helpers for putting them together. Very much appreciated. Um, so as we come together, we remind ourselves of God's commands, what he asks of us. We remind ourselves that we don't obey his commands. We don't do what he requires of us. But we also know that in his love and his faithfulness, through what Jesus has done for us on the cross, he forgives us when we come to him in repentance. We start by reminding ourselves of God, Christ's summary of the law of God. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy. We say together, Father eternal, giver of light and grace, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour. In what we have thought, in what we have said and done, through ignorance, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, we have wounded your love and marred your image in us. We are sorry and ashamed, and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and lead us out from darkness to walk as children of light. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your promise is that when we meet together, we confess our sins and we seek your forgiveness. We know that we are cleansed, renewed, forgiven and equipped to serve you more faithfully through all that Jesus has done for us on the cross by dying and rising again and by sending the Holy Spirit as an assurance of our eternal life in him. May we go from here knowing your grace, your strength, and ready to serve you more faithfully day by day. Amen. James. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Notice-wise, do uh, make sure you pick up your March news sheet, various information about what's happening then. Obviously, one of the big things coming up is Easter. Uh, we've obviously got uh, Easter Sunday. We've also got a family service, Palm Sunday, uh, and the services in the sheet as per, uh, as per the sheet for the week leading up to Easter. So uh, it's, a, it's a slightly early Easter this, this year. So Palm Sunday will be upon us in just two weeks, which doesn't feel kind of quite Eastery weather yet, but... Uh, give it a couple of weeks and it will actually be spring, won't it? So uh, do uh, reflect on that. Think about uh, who you might be able to invite to the various services that are included uh, there. Uh, it is also, as well as the notice, my pleasure this morning to read some bands of marriage. So I published the bands of marriage between Adam Peter Heaton of St. Paul's Little Eaton and Aoife Christina O'Dowd of Christ Church Belper. If any of you know any reason in law why this couple may not marry, uh, you are to declare it to me. Plenty of time. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we pray for Adam and Eve, we pray for them, uh, that uh, as they prepare for their wedding day, that you would bless them. We thank you uh, that they know and love you as their Lord and Saviour. And we pray that as they get married, uh, their marriage uh, would be one where they draw closer to each other and closer to you together. Amen. Good. And let me...
pray for our children and young people before they head out to their activities. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our children and young people uh, and pray for them that as they head out from here, uh, that they would learn more of you. Amen. So, uh, Sparks is that way, 3 to 11, thank you. Fresh is that way, uh, and so is Fuel for 11 to 14, just 7, 8, and 9. And we'll have our first part read. First reading this morning is Psalm 23. You'll find that on page 550 of the Pew Bibles or 506 in the large print. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Morning church, let's pray together. Some words from Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. Loving Heavenly Father, we give you thanks today for the love of our mothers. We thank you for the care and concern that they bring in our lives and also for the many joys that they share with us. And we ask, Lord, that you will bless them each day. And we thank you for all that they give us in our daily lives. And we pray as well that you will be with those who are grieving at this time because they have lost mothers. And we ask that you will be near those two who are sad because they are far apart from those that they love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And the psalmist continues, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among the nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. And so, Lord, we pray for the troubled nations of our world. We bring before you the continuing fighting between Israel and Hamas the plight of the refugees in that area and the struggle to bring much needed aid to those caught up in the conflict. Heavenly Father, we pray for an urgent end to the fighting. We pray for a lasting peace and we pray as well for the re release of all hostages. And Lord, we also pray for the war in Ukraine and we ask that this conflict will not be forgotten by world leaders, but that peace may be brokered here so that people's shattered lives may be rebuilt and that peace may be restored. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And the psalmist ends with these words, God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. 
Heavenly Father, we pray for your church and we pray for ourselves. Lord, we ask that your church may remain true to the good news of the gospel as revealed to us by your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. We hold up to you all who minister to us in this church that your Holy Spirit may strengthen and protect them in their various callings. And for ourselves, we ask that we may be known for our faith in Christ and our love for all God's people. May we who sit at the feet of Jesus get to know and trust him more intimately day by day, that his love may flow into our hearts so that we become channels of Christ's love and grace which flows out to all those who we meet each day. Lastly, Lord, we bring before you all those we know who have a particular need of you in their lives at this time. And perhaps in a few moments' silence, we can name those people in our hearts. Father God, we pray that you will bring healing, that you will bring strength and hope to those people who we know in all of their situations. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. second reading this morning comes from John's Gospel. Chapter 10, starting at verse 1. You can find this on page 1080 in the Pew Bibles or 993 in the large print Bibles. John chapter 10, starting at verse 1. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, the man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not listen to him. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord, and I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my father. There was again division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, He has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, These are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? This is the word of the Lord. 
Well, James will be opening that passage to us uh, in a few moments' time. But as we read of Jesus, the one who lays down his life for his people, we're going to stand and declare our faith in Jesus, the Son of God, came to earth, died for us, and rose again. Let's stand to declare our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And I'm sure the uh, alert among you will have noticed the theme for today. We're going to continue that theme, singing of the Lord who is my shepherd.
Please do sit down. And let's pray together as we come before God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And we pray that as we look at it together this morning, you will speak to us from it. Amen. Well, uh, as you will already have spotted, it is today uh, Mother's Day or Mothering Sunday. Mothering Sunday, of course, uh, is uh, the sort of church name for things. That has its roots uh, in uh, the relationship between churches, the idea that you go back to your mother church uh, on Mothering Sunday and all sorts of other traditions associated with that. But obviously, uh, in the modern world, in our 21st century world, uh, Mother's Day is a celebration of motherhood. Of course it is. It's what we do when we gather together on Mother's Day. Uh, of course, we've already noticed this as well, haven't we? That doesn't make it an easy day for everybody. For some of us, uh, it might cause us to reflect on opportunities we never had. Uh, for others of us, it will cause us to think uh, not just of that which we have and rejoice in, uh, but also that which we've lost. So we recognize that, don't we? Mother's Day is not always a straightforward day. We've prayed about that. We've talked about that. And yet at the heart of it is a good thing. Because at the heart of it is a desire to recognize and celebrate and give thanks for our mothers and to give thanks for the fact of motherhood. And when we celebrate that, what is it we're celebrating? Well, I think you can come up with a long list, but at least two things. Okay? I think we're celebrating relationship, aren't we? That close nurturing relationships that we, uh, that we hope to experience as children uh, and that we hope to uh, provide as mothers, those nurturing, those protecting relationships, those relationships which have a continuity, a perseverance, that are not temporary like some of the friendships that we've had for one reason or another, but are, are as permanent as we can make them. So we're celebrating that close relationship, that close nurturing relationship. And that brings us to the second thing, I think, that sense of persevering. We're celebrating self-giving sacrifice, aren't we? We recognize that, don't we? We recognize that parenthood, motherhood, involves making sacrifices for others, putting the needs of others first. That's what you have to do uh, when you're caring for a small child. Uh, they are very, very dependent. And of course, culturally, if we're thinking about self-sacrifice, quite naturally, one of the places we go is to motherhood. That's understandable. We're celebrating relationship, and we're celebrating self-giving. Of course, as I've already said, sometimes we celebrate those things uh, with a tear in the corner of our eye. Uh, that's the reality that we face in life, isn't it? But nevertheless, uh, these are good things. And that's really where I want us to begin uh, to think as we come to John 10 this morning. Because as we think about those two ideas, that, that close relationship that we celebrate and that self-giving love, well, what I want us to see here is that whatever we find that or whether we have or not found that in our own families and whether we see it perfectly achieved uh, in motherhood or not, nevertheless, we can all come to the one who will provide real relationship and self-giving sacrifice. So come with me to John chapter 10. This is a, a famous passage in many ways, probably a familiar passage. It wasn't difficult for me to work out which PowerPoint image to use today. Okay. It's all about the good shepherd. Three things about the good shepherd. The first is the shepherd knows his sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Now, we always have to be careful, don't we, when we come to a, a new chapter in John's or any of the other Gospels, because it doesn't automatically mean that we've got a new thought and that this is not connected to what's gone previously. Here we are in John 10, and it is following on from John 9. So the context is still the same context. Jesus has healed the blind man. We see that referenced later on in the passage. And that has caused controversy and opposition to him. 
And so as part of that, Jesus speaks these words into that context. And that, I think, helps us understand the distinctions that take place between the shepherd and the thief. The imagery in these first few verses is the imagery of the first century sheepfold. Now, we kind of know what sheepfolds look like. They are places, perhaps surrounded with stone, where you stick a load of sheep and then you put a gate on and so that the sheep don't run off. Yes? Familiar with that idea? Okay. First century sheepfolds have one other sort of factor to them, uh, and that is that uh, they were often common. That is, there would be a sheepfold be- that belonged to uh, the village or the group, and there would be more than one flock that went into that sheepfold, so that together you could have a, a better protected space, because obviously the sheep were very valuable. And that imagery is important uh, when you come to verse 3. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Here, the imagery is that image of a shepherd. So uh, the idea will be the overnight, maybe you have three or four flocks gathered together in this protected sheepfold with a door. It's a, a substantial structure. Maybe it's more like a courtyard, an inner courtyard that means that the sheep are protected. And then each morning, each of the shepherds would go and call out his sheep. And the sheep would recognize the voice, the call of their shepherd. And they would follow their shepherd out from the sheepfold. They wouldn't go with anybody they didn't recognize. They wouldn't go uh, with a stranger. They would go and follow the voice of their shepherd. Again, verse 5, a stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. So here's the contrast. Jesus starts talking about sheep and shepherds. He was the shepherd who knows his sheep. He was the shepherd who calls his sheep. Now, at this point, John tells us something quite significant about what's going on here. Look at verse 6 with me. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. This is a figure of speech. It's an illustration. It's a little bit like a parable, although not quite like the parables we're used to from the other Gospels. The point is, this isn't just about sheep and shepherds. Jesus is not just telling us about how first century shepherds worked. It's not just a history lesson. It takes the reality of how sheep shepherding worked and what sheep were like in the first century to make this point. And you can see the context of the point, can't you? And it's not difficult for us to grasp where this is going. The Old Testament context of God as the shepherd is all the way through this passage. We read about it in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. So the point that's being made here is this. The shepherd knows his sheep and they know him. The knowledge the good shepherd has of his sheep is relational. It's not just knowledge about. It's not just information about. It's relational knowledge. It's always worth us reminding ourselves of that, isn't it? Very often we make, uh, we make knowledge a very cerebral thing, all about what goes on in our minds. And we forget that true knowledge, relational knowledge, is about what goes in our, on in our minds, our hearts, and our wills. To know someone is not just to know about them. It's to know them. It's relational. And so this passage starts with a great comfort for us, doesn't it? God, the shepherd, knows his sheep. When we talk about faith, when we talk about what God is like, when we talk about what it means to be a Christian, when we talk about any of those terms, talk about being religious, talk about going to church, any of those terms that people might use with us or that we might use to talk about whatever it is that this is, at the heart of it is a relationship with God, a relationship with God, not a set of practices that we have to do, not a set of rules to keep, not a set of traditions, those are not necessarily bad things, but that's not at the heart of it, is it? At the heart of it is relationship. 
This is about knowing God and being known by God. This is about the closest possible personal relationship. This is about drawing comfort from the fact that Jesus tells us he is the shepherd and he knows his sheep. He knows his people. We are known. Some of us here this morning might not feel terribly known. That is, we might not feel that many people know us or that many people around here know us or that many people know us anymore. Well, there is an encouragement for us here, isn't there? That Jesus knows us. The good shepherd knows his sheep. And then second, we talk about the shepherd, and we, t- we shift image slightly because we talk about the jo- door. Jesus is the door, the way to salvation. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. So Jesus starts to build on the imagery. The imagery uh, is of uh, the sheep. It's of the she- it is the sheepfold, and the sheepfold has a door. Jesus starts describing himself as the door. He is the way in. And first of all, he makes a distinction between himself and false doors. He is the true door, the true way in, the true way to God. Then verse 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus is the door. He is the way to salvation. Again, he draws the distinction between himself and those who seek to exploit and destroy. In the context, those those Jewish leaders who were opposing him and therefore opposing God are in view here. But it's more than that, isn't it? It is those alternative ways to God that are offered to us. There are no real alternative ways to God at all. Our culture, like any culture, is full of of ways of getting to God. Now, who or what that God is might shift around a bit, but there's all kinds of different ways of getting what we need from a a God figure. Whether that's anything akin to the God we read about in the Scriptures or not. It's that essential human need, isn't it, for that which is beyond ourselves, whether to worship it or control it or a combination of both. But Jesus reminds us here very clearly that he is the door. He is the way to salvation. He is the way to the Father. And he makes it very clear, doesn't he, that the, he is the only way. That the other ways are ways which lead astray. Now, at this point, in a passage which we've kind of started off with that comfort of relationship, and we're going to see some more comforts a little bit later on, when we're thinking about mothers and thinking about the comfort we draw from our mothers, it may seem hard to come across this teaching. But remember this. True relationships are based on truth. True relationships are based on reality, even when that reality is hard to hear. The people who love you most and the people you love most are the people who should be the ones best able to speak truth to you and you to speak truth to them. And after all, it's not terribly loving ultimately, is it, to not tell people the truth. So we hear here, don't we, that Jesus is the shepherd who knows his sheep. Jesus is the door. He is the way to salvation. And then as we come to verse 11, We see why Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the good shepherd who lays down his life. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Here is the reality of self-giving sacrifice. Jesus lays down his life for the sheep. Now, at this point, we might think of any shepherd, really, might we? We might think of a shepherd who is willing to protect his flock. We might think of the the shepherd David out looking after the sheep and uh, getting good at slingshots because he was fighting off lions and other wild beasts. So we might think of it like that, but there's more to it than that. Look on. Verse 12, he who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees 
because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. First of all, Jesus makes the contrast between himself and the hired hand. Note the shift of imagery. This isn't a thief and a robber, but this is someone who just hasn't got quite as much skin in the game as the shepherd. This is one for whom the sheep are just a job, and that's not a job they're willing to die for. We might have some sympathy with them. We certainly might understand their position, but the contrast is the important one. If you're the sheep, uh, you don't need the hired hand, do you? Who's going to flee at the first sign of danger. You need the shepherd who's going to look after you. Again, verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Twice in these short verses, we're reminded, aren't we? Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. We're reminded of that knowledge that Jesus has of his people. I know them, and they know me. And then look how that knowledge is rooted. Think of the closest relationship you could possibly think of. And the closest relationship you could possibly think of is the perfect relationship between father and son who know each other and have been father and son throughout all eternity, who have perfect knowledge of the other and who have therefore the closest possible relationship. And then look what Jesus says I know my own and my own know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. Jesus very deliberately uses this analogy of his own relationship with his Father to express the closeness of the relationship he has with his sheep, with his people. It's an astonishing expression of close relationships. It's an astonishing comfort to us to see that we are known by Jesus Christ in this way. And then look on what it's based. I lay down my life for the sheep. Here is the context of John. We've heard this again and again, haven't we? In the context of opposition, growing opposition through these chapters in John 7 to 10 that we've been looking at, in the context of what we've been told about the Son of Man being lifted up, in the context of that knowledge that Jesus Christ is the one who is going to uh, lay down his life for his people, we are looking towards the cross, aren't we? We are beginning to see more clearly what lies ahead. That Jesus Christ will show his love for his people, for his sheep, by dying for them, by laying down his life for them. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And then more encouragement in verse 16. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. There will be one flock, one shepherd. Who are the other sheep? Well, think of the context. Jesus is here uh, in the temple, in the temple area, in in Jerusalem, certainly, talking about the sheep. The sheep, the most obvious sheep there, of course, uh, those from the people of Israel who are following God. Those who've trusted in Jesus Christ. Those from the Jews who trust Jesus. But there are other sheep. Who are they? Well, they are the Gentiles, everybody else. We're reminded, aren't we, that the salvation that Jesus comes and offers is not just for one group of people, not just for the Jews, not just for the English, not just for the people now, not just for people then. It's for all people at all all times and of all ages. This universal offer of salvation is a call to various flocks from various folds to come together to be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ. And so again, just in case we haven't caught what this is about, verse 17, for this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up. This charge I have received from my Father. It was a really important teaching for us as we seek to draw closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. The cross that Jesus faced, his final journey to Jerusalem, all those things that we're going to be thinking about on Palm Sunday and over Easter are a choice, a choice that Jesus makes. They are not things that happen by accident. It is not that events get out of hand. 
It is not that the chief priests are slightly too influential or that the Romans are slightly too powerful or that Herod's slightly too indecisive or that Barabbas is slightly too popular. It is that Jesus Christ chooses the way of the cross to lay down his life for us and take it up again, to die and rise again so that he might draw us into relationship with God. So that he might die in our place, taking the punishment we deserve for the ways in which we've ignored God, for our failure to love God with our whole heart, for our failure to love our neighbors as ourselves. Jesus Christ dies in our place. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep so that we might have life, so that we might have that gloriously close relationship with God and the Lord Jesus Christ that this passage talks about. So that, yes, we might draw together in fellowship with one another as one flock under one shepherd. Here, brothers and sisters, is the ultimate in self-giving, self-sacrificial love. Here is one who loves us and knows us and calls us to find in him the sure and certain hope and rock that will sustain us through all the challenges of life. Where other relationships aren't what we'd like them to be where things don't always end as well as we'd like, where things don't always start in the way we'd like them to either. Here is the one who gave his life for us. So what about us as we finish? There is a reaction and a response recorded here, isn't there? Verse 19, there was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Division shows differing responses. What are the responses we read about? Verse 20, many of them said, he has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who was oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? There are two responses here. One is obviously wrong. Uh, Rejection, it just doesn't make sense in the context of John's gospel, giving uh, all that Jesus has done and all that Jesus has said to reject him and claim that he has a demon. That's a, a, a illogical response. We've seen that a number of times now. It it just doesn't make any sense. But what about the second response? Others said, these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Well, here we see partial recognition, don't we? A question. And maybe that's a more positive response. But if it's going to be a more positive response, the question needs to go a bit further, doesn't it? You can't leave it at the maybe stage. Given all we've heard about Jesus Christ this morning, given all that Jesus told us about who he is, given the offer of salvation that comes in him, given the the way in which he is the door, the way to the Father, he is the good shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep, it would be a shame, wouldn't it, to leave it at the stage of questioning. And don't get me wrong, we're entitled to have questions, but if we've got questions, we seek answers. Just let me encourage you. Uh, as we reflect on this passage together, to seek and to come and to find out more about who this Jesus is, the good shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep. And let me encourage all of us here this morning to draw comfort from him as we draw closer to him. As we gather around his table, remember that he is the good shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we pray that as we come to your table in a few minutes' time, you would encourage us, help us to draw comfort from the self-giving sacrifice of your son. Help us to draw comfort from how well he knows us. Amen. Well, as we uh, prepare to gather around the Lord's table, we remind ourselves of his sacrifice for us. Let's stand and sing together. Thank you for the cross, Lord.
Sí.